to our, our region in terms of all of those things, climate, soil. Um, and so we started with a few varieties like Blau Frankish, Riesling, some of those varieties from sort of the Northern European uh, swath. You can see here the temp average temperatures in Clinton, which is where we're from, New Jersey, and the average temperatures in Eisenstadt, Austria. Very similar trajectory. Uh, we get uh, warmer a bit earlier and we stay warmer a bit later, but we still have that diurnal shift. We still have a very cool nighttime temperature, which allows us to maintain that crisp acidity in the wines. And you can see the winter minimums are very similar. So this was something particularly that I was looking for when we were comparing regions was, you know, some of these areas in, in Italy where we might have similar temperatures to, they don't get below zero or 10 degrees in the winter. There's no way that those grapes are gonna survive in our, in our climate. We also looked at precipitation. Um, so on the top you have rainfall where I am, rainfall in Eisenstadt. Uh, we have a bit more consistent precipitation and we have a bit more overall precipitation, but the trajectory is still fairly similar to, to Austria. And then if you look at the growing degree days on the bottom two charts, that again is the accumulation of heat. It's really almost identical to Bergenland in terms of tracking that, that total accumulation of heat. So this gave us the sort of uh, idea that these Austrian grapes, particularly Blaufranke, should work in our climate. And so we planted them in 2009. While the grapes were young and, and maturing, uh, I said, no one around here knows what they're doing with Blaufranke. I better go figure out how to handle this variety. And so I took a trip with my wife to Bergenland back in 2012. Uh, and the Austrian producers were incredibly gracious, opened their doors to us, spent entire days, which as a farmer and a winemaker, I know how, how valuable that time is, so I really appreciate that. Uh, and this is me walking with Anton Eby, and we just met really some of the top producers in the country. Um, really got a, a, a sense of the, the wide stylistic range that Blau Frankish has, how they're handling it in the vineyard, and really came back with the, the idea that th this really could be a, a special variety for us. <clears throat> so for us, in terms of our entire vineyard, Blau Frankish as a variety generally buds the earliest. So this can be a, a little bit of a challenge for spring frost issues. We do have spring frost where we are. Uh, I've actually had to hire helicopters two years ago that fly over the vineyards and they push the warm air down to mix, mix the air up and that can help during the spring frost nights. Um, and it's also the latest ripening variety. So as we get into the fall, if we start to have fall rainstorms, that can also be a challenge because that can obviously dilute the concentration of the grapes. The, another challenge we have is uh, downy, mil downy mildew, uh, plasmopra, which is a, a mildew that affects the leaves, the canopies. I'm not sure if you have, do you have that here in Slovenia? Yeah? yeah. So anytime you have humidity, I guess that's, that's an issue. So that can be quite a, an issue for us. But the saving grace of Blau Frankish in our area is the fruit is bulletproof compared to the other varieties that we're growing. It's a looser cluster, it's a smaller berry, and it's a much thicker skin, especially compared to varieties like Riesling and Pinot Noir that we're also focused on. So we find that even in the wettest, most humid, challenging years, the fruit never rots. It never gets botrytis. It never has uh, issues with allowing it to hang into maturity. So that's really a key in our region because that's the main challenge, is allowing the fruit uh, enough time to mature on the vine before it rots. We also really like how, how it grows. It's sort of very uh, perky and upright, and some varieties that we grow tend to be a m bit more drooping, and so my vineyard crew loves working with it because when they're hedging, it's just very easy to manage. It looks really manicured larger leaves, so we're, we're uh, doing leaf removal in the cluster zone to expose the grapes to some direct sunlight. And with those larger leaves, you know, you pull one and it exposes a large area of that cluster zone where something like a Gewürztraminer, you have to pull 10 little leaves in the same, same area. So, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, very cold hardy, so this is really a, a key benefit for our area. So across New Jersey, and it, again, it's a small region. It's actually about the size of Slovenia. As you have here, obviously, a diversity of soil and climates. So across New Jersey, we really, from north to south, have quite a bit of diversity in soil types, 
in the north where we are, it's, it's much more rolling hills, uh, deep clay loams, shale soils. As you move down towards the south, it tends to get flatter uh, and more sandy soils, better drainage, but they also have much warmer nights, and so they have problems sometimes maintaining that freshness of acidity that works with some varieties. They have had success with Blaufrankisch because the grape itself just has a great, beautiful backbone of acidity. Um, so it, it's one of the few grapes that we see working across our whole region. And that's something that we're really working together to see if we can develop because if you look at the, the other sort of emerging wine regions in America, like the Finger Lakes, they've sort of rallied around a single variety. Finger Lakes is known for Riesling. Uh, Oregon on the West Coast is known for Pinot Noir and all the producers there make Pinot Noir. So we're asking ourselves, you know, is there a variety that will work across the whole region of New Jersey that we can all sort of co-market and build a brand around? And Blaufrankisch seems to be one of the very few that uh, is, has answered that problem so far. In our area, it's described as the, the Pinot Noir of the East. And I, I find that this is interesting uh, point between Europe and America because it's also sort of the, the Pinot Noir of Eastern Europe. It's highly site-specific. Uh, a beautiful freshness, it's a food pairing wine, and we see that also in the eastern United States, that it, it really could be a wine or a grape that, for the slice of the American consumer that's interested in wines that are terroir driven, it really could be a, a quite an interesting answer to that. Um, and it's certainly in our region, as I mentioned, the, the early successes that Plow Frankish has had have has gotten a lot of critical attention really in the, the 10 years or 20 years that we've been working with the grape. The new producers, the new people that are planting vineyards are saying, hey, maybe this, uh, maybe there's something going on here. We should put a few hectares of, of Blaufrankisch in as well. So the new plantings that are going in in our area, uh, there's quite a, quite a bit of focus on Blaufrankisch, which is exciting to see. So one of the things also that I, I really appreciate about Blaufrankisch is that it has a wide range of wine styles in, in the same way that Riesling can be made in Cabinet Spätlese, Trockenmetern Ausschlese. You have different wine styles that can be very successful uh, for Blaufrankisch. And one of the Austrian producers last night was talking about how for the first 25 years of the vine's life, they, they sort of make it like a village, village of a wine or a basic wine. And then after that, they start to get serious as well. We've only been growing for 12 years, so all of our grapes are very young, and so we're, we're exploring styles that are also suitable for young vines, and I think one of those is sparkling rosé. And so this is our lineup of, of what we call crafted series wines. Um, they're very small, small volume. They're all based on uh, Italian hand gestures, so as you can see, I'm, I talk with my hands a lot, as my, my whole family does. And so all of these are based on uh, Italian hand gestures. And for our Blaufrankisch Pet Nat, which is a sparkling rosé, it's all about easy drinking. It's a fun summer wine. You know, this is, just means let's go have a drink somewhere. And so that's sort of our, our rosé Pet Nat from Blaufrankisch. Uh, we pick this usually late September. So this is the earliest uh, pass through the vineyard of our Blaufrankisch. We pick for rosé sparkling. Uh, all of our whites and our rosés are whole cluster pressed, so we don't destem anything. We really like to maintain that whole cluster as we're extracting the juice. And then very simple fermentation in stainless steel, temperature controlled. Uh, a, we'd make a pet nat style, really because we don't have the room or the equipment to make a champagne method sparkling wine, although I think it would work well with that. But this really lends itself to a, a fresh, fruity interpretation of Blaufrankisch that works really well with the American consumer. They sometimes don't want to think so much about what they're drinking, they just want to have fun doing it. And this is just a perfect wine. You put this in front of them and, uh, and you can charge 40 euros a bottle for it and they won't blink an eye, which is amazing. Uh, qu quite a good uh, product in terms of cash flow, very fre you know, young to market, uh, little aging time. You know, besides the extra work of hand bottling it, it has quite, quite low inputs for us. And of course, we bottle this unfined and unfiltered. So as it's actively fermenting, as it gets down to a small amount of sugar, we bottle that uh, under a crown cap and then allow the wine to finish fermentation in the bottle where it was, where it was bottled. And that gives it a, sort of a nice low amount of carbonation, which is nice. So our second style that we make is just a dry rosé. Uh, the people that were at the dinner last night, we had uh, one of our dry rosés earlier in the evening. Again, hand harvested, usually late September, early October. 
lower sugar content, so this is usually somewhere between 11 and 12 percent potential alcohol. Um, really bright acidity in this. I mean, we, we want this to be refreshing and crisp. Uh, light color, so again, a whole cluster pressing, trying not to extract too much of those, those phenolics, those tannins. Uh, temperature controlled fermentation, a little bit cooler to preserve the aromatics. And then we bottle this under screw cap to really preserve that freshness. And we make about six or 700 uh, cases, so about 1,000 bottles of this. I'm sorry, 10,000 bottles of this every year. Uh, and, and around 24 or 25 euros a bottle for this. And then, of course, our flagship uh, Blau Frankish is a still red version as what we're used to seeing. Generally for us, this is the latest harvested in our vineyard. We also grow some Cabernet Franc, which is harvested in late October as well, but it's pretty similar. Those two varieties jump back and forth. Uh, we've harvested this actually the first week of number, November in some cooler years where, where we could hang, hang the grapes. Uh, we do about a two-day cold soak, so destemming the grapes generally, keeping them at very cold temperatures to extract a little bit before the fermentation starts. Uh, we generally work with native yeast in this variety, so we sort of allow that native yeast population to build a bit, and then we just allow a free-rise fermentation, so allowing the wine to build its own temperature through the fermentation. Um, we do everything in open-top fermentations, about 1,000 a, a kilograms per, per bin, and we do uh, manual pigeage, pun punching down, so a more gentle extraction, somewhere around two weeks for the total maceration time. And then in, in, uh, we go into barrel. We do malolactic fermentation in barrel. I really like to do it in barrel. I find a, the oak integrates a little bit better. The mallow integrates better with a bit of oxygen. Uh, after malolactic fermentation, we do one racking, and then maybe one racking uh, every year or six months after that. Uh, we, we tend to spend about 18 months in oak. Usually the first nine months is in uh, barrique, French barrique, um, 10 or 20% new barrels, so a, a small amount of new oak, but not, not overwhelming. And then we blend those barrels into big casks, uh, boti, I'm not sure what you call them here, but like a 40 hectoliter cask, and we age the wine in that for the second year, just to sort of harmonize a bit. Uh, we bottle unfined and unfiltered generally, and we get, get about 40 euros a bottle for this, and we make about um, uh, 6,000 bottles a year currently. You can see we get the beautiful blue color that gives this grape its name. One of the things that has attracted me to this grape is that it's completely different every year we grow it. It is not uh, what we call a cookie cutter grape, where it has a really consistent uh, taste flavor profile, it really changes with the climate. And we're, we're not in California where they have very minimal vintage variation, very consistent weather. We have different weather from year to year as you do in Europe. And so in cooler years, we tend to get much more spicy, savory flavors, uh, black pepper, almost like a co-roti Syrah, you get some of this black pepper aroma. Can be very smoky, uh, like a gunflint. Um, uh, we had a tasting with uh, Dr. Jose Vulemuz, who said a cold ash aroma, and which he really appreciated in the wine, and can and be more in the cooler years on the sort of tart red and blue fruit spectrum. So tart blueberries, sour cherry, those types of flavors in a cool year. In a warm year, it could be quite different. Um, warmer spices, brown spices, Chinese five spice, all these sort of warmer spices. Uh, it can tend to have a, a prosciutto or a cured meat or a, sort of like a bloody steak tartare taste to it or aroma to it, which I noticed in, in quite a few of the Blanc Frankish last night, maybe because we were eating prosciutto too. But. Uh, and then on the fruit side, in a warmer year, it tends to be more ripe black fruit, blackberry, plum, uh, mulberry, loganberry, these sort of ripe forest berry fruits, which are, are very attractive aromas. So that's the label for our, our regular Blau Frankish. As you can see, we really like to highlight the vintage on the labels. Uh, we really like to show that the vintage, the year, is the most important part of this wine. The year in which it was grown it takes, takes precedent over everything. Below that, it's the winery or the producer that's making it. And below that, it's the variety that this grape is coming from. We received some really uh, good scores early on in our in our sort of uh, marketing of Blaufrankisch, we had a 92 from James Suckling, which was at 
at the point one of the highest uh, scores in New Jersey from a, an international producer. Um, Edible Jersey, which is sort of a, a regional magazine, said that our, our Blaufrankisch was the finest red wine made in New Jersey. And so I think that made a lot of people pay attention. Whether or not that's true, I think is totally subjective. But when somebody says that from a journalism, everyone's eyes sort of turn to you and, and look at you and, and say, like, why? Why is that? What are you doing? What's different than what we're doing? And so I think that's got a lot of uh, consumer perception and also industry uh, interest in this grape and why it's being successful at, at such an early stage in the game. So marketing Blaufrankisch certainly can be a challenge as it is with I'm sure many of us. Um, when we first opened the winery, this is what our Blaufrankisch label looked like. So my thought was, we're in New Jersey, which is a new wine region. We have to first convince people to drink local wines and I'm gonna start with my reputation on a variety that nobody's heard of. Um, so maybe let's make it a little bit easier for the consumer to understand, or at least appreciate, or even order, order this grape when they come to our tasting room. And so our first label was, was called Blue, Blueprint, which is like a, an architectural drawing. Still the blue and blau. Um, and so we did the blueprint of a barrel and sort of all the different barrel parts on there and, and put Blau Frankish uh, underneath that. As the consumer recognition has expanded, when we, when we sort of redesigned our labels, we thought, well, look, if no one else is going to stand up and, and be a promoter of Blau Frankish, we need to do that. We need to show the consumer that you have to learn how to pronounce this grape, first of all. And it's, it's a grape that's interesting to grow and to drink here, and so you should become more familiar with it. So these are some of the challenges we dealt with initially was, you know, people come into the winery looking for Pinot Grigio and Cabernet Sauvignon. And we say, well, those, those grapes don't really grow well in this area. Well, what does grow well is Blaufrankisch because we have a very similar climate to Austria. And let's taste this. And if you like Pinot Noir, if you like Syrah, you may find that this is interesting to your palate. I think one of the bigger uh, challenges we have is it's difficult for English speakers. As I mentioned, when we see the umlaut, everybody just doesn't want to even try to attempt to pronounce whatever word that is. Um, and so, that's obviously a learning curve for all of us. I think one of the biggest challenges, and maybe this is a challenge in Europe as well, is that there's a bit of name confusion because every region in Europe calls the, the grape by their, their own name. Whereas if you're growing Pinot Noir in Europe, you're generally calling it Pinot Noir. Um, and so these regional names can be confusing for the consumer because they might have tasted a Lemberger, but they don't even know that that's the same grape as Blaufrankisch or as Keck Frankosch or as Modras Franginje. They don't understand that those are all the same varieties. Um, and so we, one of my jobs when someone plants Blaufrankisch in the United States is the next day I knock on their door and we have some big guys behind me and we say, hey, you're calling this Blau Frankish, you don't have a choice because we'll have no New Jersey Lemberger in our state. Uh, that's not gonna help the cause. That's only gonna, gonna fracture the market. Um, and so we, we really try to educate even though new winemakers in the area that if we're gonna be marketing this and branding this as an upcoming variety, we need to at least be using the same name. And so we've chosen Blau Frankish because I think globally that has probably the, the, the most understanding from the consumer. What, what we have is a very unique um, business model. So we, because of the density of people in our area, we sell 100% of our wine on the farm. So everyone that's drinking my wine is coming to the farm, is walking the vineyards, often with me, is tasting in the tasting room. And so we have a really unique opportunity to educate that consumer that doesn't exist when you're putting your wine in a liquor store or a wine shop next to a thousand bottles. Maybe the wine shop owner knows a bit about that wine and has tasted it with you, but they're not gonna be able to tell the whole story of why that wine is important and why it, someone should be interested in it. Uh, that you are, because you have the captive audience. You have people on your, on your soil where you're growing the grape and where you're making the wine and where you're drinking the wine. And so the people that come to our farm get this sort of full circle experience where they appreciate it as an agricultural product, they appreciate it as a gastronomic product, and they start to sort of become our disciples and, and it's, it spreads out from there. It's sort of a grassroots movement. And what we found is the next thing that we need to tackle, which we're, we're working on now, is really what we call the industry gatekeepers. Uh, these are the people that, that really know wine and that decide 
at least in, in our area, what wine is cool to drink. Um, and, and this is sort of the New York sommelier, you know. And luckily, the New York sommelier is very adventurous, and they really want to try and help consumers discover new regions and new varieties and new styles of wine that they actually appreciate drinking rather than selling them you know, something that they don't want to drink or something that's expensive. They, they pride themselves on having obscurity on their wine list because they think, you know, I'm showing you something that the restaurant next door is not showing you. So these are the people that we need to connect with when we're marketing Black Frankish. We need to have the sommelier community come out and taste with us because when they do, like we did last night, all we're talking about is food. What food pairs with this? What food is better for this style? Um, and that is how you sell wine in, in America because generally wine is on the dinner table and we drink beer after work or during the day and a cocktail at night, but wine is, is generally on the dinner table. And so connecting food with wine is really important. Um, sort of in the United States as a whole, there's really been quite a bit of momentum on, on Blau Frankish. These are some of the larger uh, journalist magazines that we have. 750 Daily recently wrote an article that was called Blau Frankish's Global Comeback. Uh, and this is really an industry-focused magazine, at least a million readers. And their, their sub-headline was, Plantings and quality of this native Austrian red grape are increasing, both in its home turf and in New World regions. While it's unlikely that Blau Frankish will ever become as universal as Pinot Noir or Cabernet Sauvignon, it has established itself as more than just an obscurity, with its ability to produce high-quality, nuanced wines, even in unfavorable conditions, expect more fine examples from Austria to the United States in the future. And so those, they touched on a couple key points there. One is that it can make really good wine even in unfavorable conditions, which we sometimes have on the East Coast. If you can make a high quality wine even in a challenging vintage, you're gonna have growth of that category. It, as I mentioned, you know, there's sort of this, this idea that it's a, an obscure grape, and you see the Forbes article, it's the best red you've never heard of. I think that we really need to grab that concept and lean into it and run with it, because people like that right now. That's what people want, is something that they haven't tasted. Um, so it's great to see that these articles that are coming out are talking about that. This is, a, this is a wine maybe you don't know, but that you should know. So our, our uh, philosophy now is, Fear not the umlaut. And so our, our winery is having its 10th uh, anniversary this year, and we're making T-shirts that say, Fear not the umlaut, because we also grow Gewürztraminer, which is equally challenging for Americans to say. Um, but it's really about leaning into this, this obscurity and uniqueness and distinctiveness, as previous speakers have said, of Blau Frankish, and, and really being proud of that, and really wanting to show that to the consumer that's coming to taste your wine. So as I said, embracing the, the uniqueness of the grape and the variety and also its ability to translate terroir. And I think terroir is a, a much better understood concept in Europe than it is in America. Um, it's, we're still sort of in the beginning stages of the, what we call the farm to table movement where local food is sort of just a, a given here for, for Europeans where you're, you're gonna eat what's grown and raised around you, that concept is sort of new to the American consumer, believe it or not, because we have these giant grocery stores where we have bananas from Paraguay and everything, and so eating locally is a really sort of new concept in the last few decades. Drinking locally is even newer because a lot of these areas have not had an established wine culture or, or wine growing culture. And so discovering terroir is new for us, and it's one of the reasons we've chosen to plant Blau Frankish, Riesling, and Pinot Noir as our top three varieties that we grow because those grapes really have been shown to translate terroir in a very unique way. And for me as a young winemaker and a young grower, what I want to do in my lifetime is to understand my climate and my soils and, and the ability of my land to produce wine. What better way to do that than with these grapes that are showcasing that in a, in a really unique way? I think we need to lean into, again, as I said, to the food friendliness of Blau Frankish. I mean, tasting those wines last night, it was just like every dish that was on the table, which was so beautiful, paired differently with each of the different styles. 
Um, and that's a unique thing. I mean, there are a lot of big, overblown, over-oaked wines that maybe are interesting for people to just sit and have a glass of, but when you put them on the table, they don't work well with food. They're, they're, they're too intense. Um, and so I think the food friendliness and the, the uh, freshness and the acidity backbone of Blau Frankish is really a key that we need to lean into. Uh, I think another thing that's heavily trending in the United States is moving away from the sort of industrialized products to more locally produced, family-owned, uh, sustainably-minded products. And this happens both in food and in, and in beverage. And this is really taking off. And we're sort of, it's taking off faster than the wine scene. So we're sort of grabbing at the coattails of this movement and saying, yeah, if you're going to go to the farmer's market and shop for local peppers, also buy some local wine while you're there because that's, that's also an agricultural product. And, uh, and you should be as interested in buying that locally as you are your, your produce. And so from what it sounds like, particularly in, in Slovenia, almost all of the producers are small and family owned and artisanal and, and probably have a lot of uniqueness from, from producer to producer. So that's something that really is attractive to the American consumer. They want to see uh, people that care about what they're growing, people that have personality behind the products. Uh, they don't want to buy things from uh, multinational corporations anymore. Um, I think we've had enough of that, all of us. I think educating the consumer is, is really important, obviously, for this grape. You know, we have a long way to go there. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it really starts with the, the gatekeepers, the, the people that are already understand wine. We need to educate them about Blau Frankish, and then they sort of trickle down from there where they educate the consumer after that. Unless you're in a situation like us where we have sort of a direct connection to the consumer, um, which again is, is unique, but also we try to really make the best of that opportunity. And finally, and I think this is probably the biggest thing, the, the American consumer today is all about the joy of discovery. When I go to a wine restaurant, I don't think I've ever picked a wine off the wine list that I've tasted before. I always want to taste something different. I want to taste something new. I want to explore a new region. I want to explore new flavors. The, the young, especially, generation is very adventurous in their taste profiles. Uh, and they, they do not want to drink, again, what their parents were drinking or what they grew up drinking. They want to drink something that's new. And so that joy of discovery is something that I think all of us can sort of lean on with a Blau Frankish because most people haven't had it before or haven't had at least the style that you're offering it in before. And um, I think that's something that we can sort of all, all rally around as we, as we develop this Pinot Noir of the East. So if you come visit, I have a German dog. He speaks German better than I can, so maybe he can translate for me. Uh, I would love to have you all. My information is here. Uh, we're on social media and all of that stuff. But honestly, if you ever come, uh, I know some of you do tastings in New York City. We're an hour west of New York City. So if you need a place to stay, plenty of, plenty of room at our place. Please join us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. I think that was a very insightful story about how to succeed somewhere without tradition. And you have nothing to lean on, so you invented everything, and it looks like you did it right, so great. Uh, any question for Mike? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm abusing my food, which is not really a question, but I, I, some of the folks here have already heard this. Sorry. Uh, when I, a lot of people ask me wh why this conference, and, and especially why in Slovenia, right? And so I, I told everybody, um, I'm born in the state of New Jersey, the United States. My mother's family's New Jersey. <laughs> Lived the first year, eight years of my life in New Jersey. Used to know New Jersey in, inside out. I had to learn from Guillaume that there's a movement, a Blaufrankish <laughs> movement in my birth state, <laughs> and I have, I have never tasted one of the wines. So I said, that's the reason for an international uh, Blaufrankish uh, conference here. Uh, just a couple of quick marketing comments, because a lot of us are in, in the business of either directly selling wine, or if we're writing about it, we're basically also in that business. Uh, uh, just remember, this can only be the new grape on the block once. That's right. And uh, we've already been around here. One story we'll tell you about the uh, event that we put together in 2010 in New York City, and we got two 
back-to-back -back articles in the New York Times from Eric Asimov about the, how excited he was about the wines. And I mean, it did get something ignited, but you need, you need to keep push, pushing the wheel. Uh, one thing that's funny about the United States, most of you will not recognize this, but there, there is really a movement afoot to try to cap, to, to nail your uh, future as a wine growing era or state to a particular grape. Finger Lakes are often used as example. I'm involved with the conference that we do every two years in the Finger Lakes to try to extend the appreciation. And it's very dangerous, especially premature in most places to try to nail your reputation to a single grape. Just ask the people who are trying to grow other grapes in, uh, in the Finger Lakes. And uh, Herman Wiemer's uh, winery makes wonderful wild Frankish in the Finger Lakes. It's one of the most interesting ones that I know of outside of, uh, uh, of Europe. And one of my early assistants in the late 80s planted the first, at my suggestion, planted the first Bois Frankish in, in, uh, in Michigan and, and marketed it as Blue Frank. Anyway, but it took me 10 years to get the folks at Wiemer to convince them to take Lemberger off the label and put Blau Frankish on it. Now, why? Because they were marketing the wine internally. They were selling it very well to, the, to their cellar door customers, but their distributors are saying, you can forget that. And the same problem repeated itself with, with Gewurztraminer. Has that umlaut? People think, oh, it's a sweet German wine. I'm not interested. The distributor said, we won't touch it. I said, it's Traminer, it's, it's, the, it's the, in the Jura, it's the most trendy grape yeah, right. today. And, but it, but it, it, it's difficult to reconcile the markets that you have at the cellar door with the potential to promote your wine uh, outside. And that's really where, uh, if you have to suck it up as a non-German speaker and put Blaufränkisch on your label, just like a Weissburgunder producers, if only they had all decided a long time ago to put Pinot Blanc on their label, we would be so much further in the appreciation of those wines. So just a couple of anecdotes. Thanks, David. Do not fear the umlaut, yeah? Okay. Thank thanks, you. thanks, Mike, for, for your uh, for your saying, and now uh, we stepped very well into the field of marketing, the how to sell the grape we are talking today, which is Blau Frankish. And Pass, where are you? She is going to tell us more how is that done in the, in the, in the first hand. So, Pass, the stage is yours. Hello, Hello everybody. Uh, thank you uh, so much for this invitation and to share with you some thought, thoughts uh, about what we do uh, daily in, um, in a business. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so this uh, wonderful uh, organization and, and this focus on a lovely uh, great variety. And, and thank you also, Velika uh, Lega, to make possible that um, I'm here uh, this week uh, with my whole family because it's, uh, it's holidays, uh, Thursday and Friday in France, and um, it was a challenging week uh, to, to be uh, here. But we, we managed, and uh, thank you for the, all the efforts. Um, so I will, um, I don't have presentation, I will uh, talk to you. So uh, if you have any question, then we can, we can uh, talk more. But um, just a brief presentation of who I am, um, because maybe, uh, well, it's uh, the Somali <laughs> um, representation uh, in these talks. And um, uh, so I'm an Argent Argentinian. Um, I am a work uh, since 2003 in the restaurant business and um, I start just polishing glasses and, and because we, we do it all by hand in Argentina at that time. So I, I was uh, studying literature and I started as a sommelier, as just polishing and cleaning. <laughs> and then I learned more and more about the wine. I was in a very good restaurant. Uh, taking care about the details and about the knowledge and education. Um, so I learned uh, there and I stay five years in this restaurant. So I finish um, my professor, professor uh, literature professor, and also uh, I study at the same time sommelierie. 
uh, so uh, to become a sommelier. And then, uh, so then, well, I work uh, 13 years in Buenos Aires. And, um, uh, and then in 2012, I decided to leave uh, Argentina uh, for edu educational reasons. Um, maybe as most of you know, and if you visit Argentina, you know that in Argentina, uh, we mostly drink only Argentinian wine. Uh, so for a sommelier, it's quite challenging uh, if we want to go gain more knowledge or learn more about international wine. We have to or have the possibility to travel very often or um, yes, or it's, it's very, very tough to find a Chablis in the market. So it's very challenging to be uh, knowledgeable and to have uh, the, um, the tasting, tasting experience. Um, for, for a sommelier. So that's why it was not economical reasons, it was just for, for keep on learning and because I, I start also uh, challenging myself in the competitions, you know, international competitions, best sommelier of Argentina, then best sommelier of, of America and best sommelier of the world. So I need to train my palate and my education like as fast as possible. So in two, 10 years ago, I decided to leave Argentina. And um, so when I left Argentina, uh, my, my choice was a little bit um, more cultural than wine focused, if I can say. I decided to move to France. Um, and because uh, maybe for a sommelier, the dream places are New York or London, where you have all the wines of the world. And, uh, but well, I decided France because I wanted to learn another language. So if you see that my English is it's, it's worse, <laughs> it's, uh, more I live in France, my, my English is getting worse. Uh, but okay, my French is okay now <laughs> after 10 years living in, in France. Um, and uh, so in France it was uh, very, yeah, I think it's the, the country, the more challenging country to sell uh, for non-French wine. <laughs> and that's why I, I tell this story. But um, my story so was to be from a mar uh, market, uh, Argentinian market focus in the Argentinian wine, and then to a French market focus in the French wine. So um, when I arrived to Paris, I started working in a, in a restaurant. I tried to be as open-minded as possible. It was just starting, uh, it, it was starting like coming more wines from uh, outside France, but uh, there were not, not a lot of, uh, for example, if you want to find uh, Australia or New Zealand, there was quite a few, but um, the, the center of the market in, in, in France uh, is French wine and then Italy and Spain, you know, and, and, and Portugal. Uh, mostly for the for the Porto to and a lot of Porto to cook, um, but uh, so the market was quite uh, difficult if you want to be very open-minded or if you want to taste a lot of things. But well, I was in France, so learning French, and I decided to to when I when I start learning a little bit of French, to work in the Three Stars um, Michelin uh, restaurant in Paris. So and this is just for you to. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you, the ones that visit Paris and, and know the city, um, you can see uh, like uh, there is uh, the city is divided, really divided in, in two. Um, the one part of the city is very traditional and one part of the city is more open-minded and, uh, and um, is getting more, um, yes, uh, eclectic with wines and the regions. And so it's like living in, in two countries in the same city. But the first restaurant I worked, so was only about Chardonnay, only about Bordeaux, only about Pinot Noir. So it's, it's uh, uh, three starts in Paris. It's, it's considered to be, you know, the, the best, best place you can eat um, and you can drink. But in the sommelier scene, um, it's it's very centered in um, in Burgundy, Bordeaux, and um, yeah, and and that's that's the main focus. That's what we sell. That's we, what we work with. Um, that is the Alsace is a small part of the wine list. Then uh, you know, big big part of uh, white Burgundy. Um, then some whites of of, of France, and then is. Uh, 
uh, red burgundy and bordeaux so you you find in this this reality um, and the most expensive the better uh, to sell uh, for sure so in the there is a lot of, of restaurant that works like this and they have I mean we, we had a very beautiful um, clients and I mean beautiful bottles that are open client um, you know the, the Monday I mean uh, for lunch Latash it was was easy it was it was this is crazy what uh, but for a sommelier so they do this now there's Burgundy Bordeaux Burgundy Bordeaux and I was a little bit uh, suffocating maybe when because I, I was arriving to France and I wanted to learn about everything and was impressive um, but so I I uh, decided to move uh, and and we create a little bit a small restaurant with a very eclectic wine list and I decided to do what was my dream to do like a wine list like in New York you know with all different grapes all different uh, countries all mixed up uh, maybe just arranged by style and so there I could have a small wine list but very <laughs> Um, uh, or yes, uh, eclectic, if I can, I can say, um, and and there I think it's the when you found that uh, that French people is much more open, and that they are more open to to taste different things, different wines, different origins. But well, it was now ten years, so now I think we are in a moment that is another. Um, another, you know, uh, open uh, uh, space also for for wines from the from the world. Um, so today, uh, in 2018, I start working with uh, Anne Sophie Pic, and Anne Sophie Pic is a woman chef. Uh, that she is the fourth generation uh, in the in the restaurant business. Uh, so her grand grandmother started the business in Saint Pere, in in uh, very near Valence, in the Rhone Valley. And um, and she is the only woman uh, having three stars in in France. Um, so I start working with her. We we uh, we um, we are. I mean, uh, we uh, found each other in a in a film about um, uh, the, how is the woman in the kitchen in the in a woman chefs in France because uh, in the world as well. Uh, so we, we found each other and, and she really liked uh, my approach about wines and beverage and we start working. Um, so today it's not about only France because we work, uh, we are, have restaurants in, in London, in Singapore, in Lausanne and in, in mainly in France. And we have some um, pop-ups and openings in the next months. Um, but I tell you this story because so from the thir three stars in, in Paris to the three stars uh, with Anne Sophie, I think that was um, well was a big uh, difference. So not all the three stars in, in France are like this, but mostly um, and for the foreign wine is opening like for for the wines by the glass and and all that that was increasing uh, in the in the last years. Um, but um, so in, in to sell brown Frankish, you need the sommeliers uh, for sure in mostly in, in France because it's very uh, you can have uh, well the, 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 the French wines uh, the market is very very big and important um, but you need the sommeliers but you need the sommeliers that are prepared to sell uh, grapes like uh, Blau Frankish. That it's not all of them, as, as I, I told you, uh, because it, there are a lot of, uh, of, uh, of the professionals that are centered in, in the classic regions. Um, so, uh, in, um, since I, uh, since, uh, I, I left uh, this, um, this uh, um, restaurant, um, I also uh, I found out that uh, Blau Frankish can be uh, it has the place uh, for the French uh, taste and, and palate. So uh, I think it's it's a market that can be developed um, in in with, it has a great potential. And why I say this because um, uh, well because of the of the characteristic of Blau Frankish, but also because of gastronomy. 
and um, uh, tasting and studying uh, grapes um, and wines. I was, I had like this um, mental uh, map that maybe is also eclectic, and I, I share with you like very, um, like I, I, in my universe, it was like Syrah, uh, Blau Frankish, Teroldego, and Malbec, and I have my explanation about this from the spicy to the more floral, but or to the more floral to the more spicy. Uh, in the in the two um, in the in the two extremes, uh, more powerful and more in intensity and, and tannins. But I think these these four grapes were like my, my my favorites in all in all the wine list. So I tr we try to to push as much uh, the grapes that maybe the the French uh, uh, people didn't know um, and to expand their knowledge. Uh, and also, uh, I think in France, also um, it's important to expand the knowledge of the sommeliers, as I told you, uh, because um, all we found in these uh, three stars that we are working only with some grapes and some styles. Um, but uh, I was always uh, very worried about how a sommelier can develop all the skills in the markets that have uh, only the, I mean, the, the, the wines of the country. So my mission in the restaurants where is, is to uh, give the knowledge to the sommelier and they know it and they know that they will be educated and then give the knowledge to the client without that the client don't know that we are education, but they, they, we are sharing and we are uh, giving uh, wines from the world uh, in, uh, in restaurants that can be uh, uh, three stars, two stars. Um, so the, one of the, 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 um, the difficult things to, when I arrived is was to, to say, okay, let, let's see, let's see what happens in three stars three stars. Also, we can sell wines from all the world. Even now the, where I work, three stars is in Valence, so it's in the Rhone Valley, very close to Cornas and Cotroti. So there is, you imagine, is a big pressure also to sell uh, the uh, north, northern Rhone uh, um, wines. Uh, but uh, when a client arrived to a three stars, we are in the region, but also we are in the world. So uh, for us, it's our opportunity to show the world as well and to show the diversity and also very um, focusing on the pairings. If a client comes to taste a pairing, we are going to give the best pairing that we, that we can. And then we have the, the, the 30,000 bottles in the cellar. But uh, a 30 percent of the wine list is a foreign wine. A um, lot of uh, European wine, but also from the Americas and also uh, Australia. So it's, it's really um, open. And I think we can show that it's, if in France it's possible to sell uh, Blau Frankish, and uh, uh, that is mostly from Austria, what we have in the, in the list, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's possible uh, to, um, to show uh, how it works and how it's, uh, can combine with um, with uh, French preparations with uh, with the creations of the chef. Other positive thing about Blau Frankish and how to sell uh, Blau Frankish, I think, it's that there is no uh, like a lot of pressure or what I see with uh, the pairing of the local food. Well, being Argentinian, I I always I'm. Uh, a little bit um, sad when I see that French people only drink Argentinian wine in the Argentinian restaurants. They drink Italian wine in the Italian restaurant, they, and so on. No, the Greek uh, wine in the Greek restaurant. And I think in in your case, and in the if we talk about Blau Frankish or Austria uh, or Slovenia, uh, what we taste is that maybe it's not the first thing that uh, a client will say, okay, I drink Blau Frankish and I, I will pair it with this. Um, and that is, I think it's a positive thing because if not, you get in a close-minded uh, and you, you will... We, we, I have uh, some difficulties of, uh, to sell, even for me, maybe it's more easy, easier to sell Blanc Frankish than Malbec, because Malbec is stronger in the sense of, 
of place and maybe of pairings or food. Uh, so if a French, uh, a French client says, okay, you give me Mal Malbec with a, with a, um, with a duck, uh, I have to explain like, very much why I'm doing this pairing. Um, while Balfrankish, Bar they don't have a knowledge about, I mean, or, or some regional pairings. Uh, so, so this, I think this uh, is a virtue, is uh, something that is positive. Um, there is, uh, so this place uh, for Balfrankish in the French uh, palate, because I think the French uh, people are very used to the high acidity, uh, the fresh wines, and uh, they uh, want to taste something different. Um, but also, for example, Gamay is, uh, Beaujolais is in the trend, but a lot of French people notes a lot of, knows in between brackets uh, a lot of, of, of Beaujolais or Morgon or the, the Cruz, but uh, they have some, I mean, knowledge about it, so they are not maybe some enthusiastic about uh, tasting uh, Gamay. Syrah is delicious, but uh, also, and, and they have a lot of connections with, with Blau Frankish, but we have a lot of Syrah that needs time, a lot of time in the bottle, so we have to mature um, in our cellar uh, a lot of Cote Roti, Ceramitage. So for some parents, it won't work. Uh, Cabernet Franc in, in France, I think it's not is not well un understood <laughs> um, in in the in the um, gastronomic restaurants or in the in the uh, the thoughts of the French classic French drinker um, that it's a little bit more extreme. So it's a little bit har harder to sell. Um, and in between these three grapes, like Gamay Syrah and Cabernet Franc, I think Brel Frankish has a place, privileged pl place to uh, be, be uh, to, to be proposed uh, because in the, well, a little less tannin than, than Syrah, is it juicy, it's uh, very delicious with a little bit of spice, um, the black fruits. Um, and I think that the, we, we try to serve blind uh, to the French clients so they ne then can discover first that uh, there are a lot of clients that don't know that in Austria, for example, they make wine. If they know that in Austria they make wine, they think it is only white, so we show uh, uh, red. And, and yes, and they discover a new region, new, new grape, and, and an excellent pairing. Um, I was uh, talking also to, um, uh, for example, to uh, colleagues uh, about this, and uh, there, uh, I think Blau Frankish also is a grape that we study mostly uh, in, in for in, in when we study for sommelier, but then in competitions, maybe when you do competitions, you start getting uh, very curious about all the grapes because competitions can, everything can happen. Uh, but for the master sommelier, for example, diploma, you, we know we won't get a Blau Frankish, a blind Blau Frankish, so it's not what we taste most when, when preparing the master sommelier. So I think it, Blau Frankish is, uh, for, by it's, it suits a lot, of, uh, a lot of sommeliers that are preparing for competitions or, for, or then uh, wine, um, uh, wine uh, educators or people that is following the master of wine. So, so not all the sommeliers are curious about. I think you have to uh, really um, be uh, very curious about everything and then you find your grape. And as I told you, uh, well, this, this, for me, this progression, like uh, Syrah, Brau, Frankish, uh, Terol de Godil is a lovely grape that I, that I love, and then it has that relation also with Syrah. And uh, you, you can ask why Malbec is there, <laughs> but Malbec in the, I, I'm not forcing, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, today there are a lot of Malbecs that share a lot of, of characteristics in the floral, also in turning in more in the black fruits and, and acidity and a mo, um, mostly moderate uh, tanning. Um, it depends how, 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 how it's made. Um, 
but I think these are uh, four uh, fantastic uh, grapes. And uh, but in, in in France, I think it's easier even to sell Blanc Frankish than uh, well for sure Teroldigo that is not not is, is a, a grape that is not very well known. Uh, but we have really really good uh, good. Uh, they all love uh, Blau, Blau Frankish when we sell. When we sell it is is mostly by the glass, but also what we do is uh, we do um, uh, three months of some regions all together, like uh, a region focusing in, in Croatia, Slovenia, Austria, uh, Germany, uh, so they can have also a, a context. It's not just one Blau Frankish in the list, so that is like a system uh, for the French people to, to have uh, this say, okay, they, they're doing not only wine in Austria, they're doing also in, in Slovenia or in Croatia. Uh, so we, we try to do this, this system uh, to, to sell. And, um, well, is, one, one thing is, is for sure uh, challenging is that uh, we, we, I mean, we want to give uh, different things to the client. We want to give uh, new things to the client. We are not obliged because it's, it's uh, you know, when you are in France, you can sell just French wine and there is, there is diversity, so you can, you can sell just French wine. But I think it's important to place the main grapes and the main styles in the list, no matter in which country you are, but you have to battle to do this. Um, I asked to, uh, I was talking a couple of days ago with uh, David Biro. David Biro is a sommelier in France. He was a uh, lot of uh, times uh, fi uh, finalist in the best sommelier of the world. So um, I think I get the, the right person to ask. Uh, I ask uh, many colleagues, but he is now, for example, he's a, it's a good question now because now I'm selling Blau Frankish by the glass in a two stars um, Michelin restaurant uh, that is called Sous Massure. Uh, that is uh, Thierry Marx, is a very well known chef. And uh, David Biro is um, selling by the glass Blau Frankish um, and it's a uh, pairing with um, uh, Wagyu beef, um, also a uh, lovage pepper and shiso. So you can have, you know, those, this uh, texture combination because the very uh, like um, texture of the wagyu beef that is uh, intense and and um, with more fat and the blau frankish with its beautiful uh, freshness um, balance uh, with the very nice tannins but not so much and with the aromatics also with the of the shiso or or the a little bit of herbal spice. Um, uh, which he says, I, I'm selling Blau Frankish by the glass and Pinot de Nuit, that is much more peppery and intense, uh, but there are two great grapes to, to propose to the client, and he is in Paris in, in two stars. So things are changing a lot in the last years. I think the market is, is, uh, is much more open, and, uh, and, the, um, and the, the, the pairings we can do with the, with the preparations are just incredible. Um, we in, uh, in the group pick uh, one of the of the dishes that are um, very well known uh, from Anne Sophie. It's uh, like a beetroot uh, that she do with a, uh, it's a beetroot and it has a coffee and also uh, some um, barberry. So it has also the, the juiciness of the beetroot, the intensity, the earthy and also the, the freshness, um, and also the, a little bit of this uh, uh, coffee aromas, and that give also uh, bitterness, and, and that underlines with a sweetness, um, and it really, really works uh, with, with Blau Frankish. So also, uh, I see a possibility for Blau Frankish also to pair with, with preparations that we need a red wine, but, you know, with not so well, very balanced oak, very nice acidity, and the acidity here is, I think, the most important for the for the for the French palate, um, and they they f they find it not shocking. In Argentina, if you make taste of Blau Frankish, maybe it's going to be a little bit 
in the first uh, uh, the clients will think okay i have to get used to this this freshness uh, but in in france even if in a not enormous market for you uh, i think there is a lot of possibilities and a lot of uh, position uh, for 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 uh, blau frankish um, we pair it as well with a um, um, breast uh, pigeon uh, that is infused with black currant leaves and also some uh, floral uh, like the damson roses which is beautiful because it has also beet roots and also the cooking juice uh, and this is like a wonderful pairing as well so there will be always a place uh, for blau frankish in uh, for the for the kitchen of uh, of Anne sophie peak i think she she has a lot of elements that has in common uh, with this, this grape um, and um, yes so that is a little bit um, what i wanted to share with you um, what i wanted to to talk about france because maybe sometimes you say okay uh, we see in instagram a lot of trends a lot of um, a lot of publications but when you we are working in paris there is some decisions to make uh, where if you're going to taste or be expert in in burgundy or in bordeaux or if you're going to get a little bit more in the in the well natural wine scene or in the more eclectic uh, wine list and it's it's not easy to combine uh, both things i mean uh, working with a top chef and have the possibility of have a wine list like with wines from all uh, places of the world but not not to have just wines from all the places of the world but wines that can be very good with the pairings with the kitchen with the focus of the style of of of, of the food um, and and with the great uh, plus we have also the great pressure about well, we are in a region that is a wine region. Uh, we sell a lot of, of run. It's our, it's our main part of the, of the seller. Uh, but uh, also, I, I defend, I want to have always wines from all parts of the world um, and the, the best grapes as well that I think that can be iconic, that can have uh, a characteristic, a personality. Um, but I can assure you that uh, it's not difficult to, to, to sell a Blau Frankish in, in, in France. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your attention. And yes, if you have some questions, uh, I will be here. Yes, as well. thank, thank you, Pass. <laughs> I became hungry. <laughs> yes. So, and it's a, it's, it's a truth. If I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. So, selling Blau Frankish in, in, in France, so uh, there is the world waiting for you. Uh, and I think, uh, I think especially, especially chefs might, or restaurant owners might have questions for you, Pass. Uh, uh, and the idea that came from my, from my head is that creating menus or, or, or dishes that actually work and I think we need to create a big workshop and to combine winemakers and, and chefs and having fun and then some good results will come out. Any questions for Pass, please? Yes. I just want to make sure I understand. So, French uh, diners whom you are introducing for the first time to Blau Frankish, this is almost always in the context of a degustation menu or where you have open glasses, yes, right. I mean, that's very important. I, I love that you mentioned the beet root because I, I love the beet connection and, and it points out one of the things that uh, I long ago was a restaurateur myself. Uh, you know, it's great if you can if you can show what I call the, the Weintertliche Speisen, the, 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 the dishes that are kill, that kill wines, that destroy wine. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, beetroot is a good example, you know, artichoke, these things. If you can show that you have a, you have a, a wine that can master one of the uh, Weintertliche Speisen, it's, it's always a good entry point. Yes, well, we, we sell uh, mostly, uh, what I try to do is uh, always in the tasting menu, 
Uh, no matter we are in the balance uh, for the for the restaurant three stars, then in total it's uh, nine, nine stars. So we have a lot of restaurants one, two, and, and one three. But what I always try to do is in the tasting menus, uh, trying not to repeat uh, country <laughs> or beverage, or if we can. Well, France maybe gets a little bit more because we're in France. But uh, but being show diversity and diversity of textures of origins and but focusing in the in the pairing so we taste uh, we taste with the with the chef we i show the wines and uh, and and we which we, we choose we choose uh, what is the best but yes it's mostly um it's mostly by by the glass or in the in the tasting menu but uh, also uh, i have in the wine list uh, by the bottle as well references and I, that's why I want to educate each sommelier of the restaurant because if they are in France and they will gain uh, only French uh, knowledge of wine, for me the job is not made. Uh, I have to make strong sommeliers to work all over the world because we don't know when the, the work will be tomorrow. So if they have to have the taste of, of the of the countries of the wines. And there is a, a big pressure about uh, localism and the local, 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 local. I know this, but I think it's, uh, in our world of Somalia, it's, it's about uh, origins, diversity, uh, discoveries, sharing. So yes, we start by the, by the tasting menu, but then uh, we mostly well, educate sommeliers to sell by the bottle as well and to yeah share the passion of, of of another different grape and different taste and different origin um but the most important is that they are delicious wines and well made and yes that is the most important <laughs> and which countries are represented with blau frankish on your list uh, is austria austria, austria. Yes, yes okay at Mainly. the moment or austria <laughs> yeah okay okay Thank you, Paz, very much. Thank you. And I am calling uh, Dr. Uh, Ferdinand Regner to tell us a bit of the history of the Blau Frankish and geneal genealogy. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, genealogy about uh, about uh, the grape variety, and there are some new discoveries to be shown. Yeah. So no, not new. Not new. Okay, an old one. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Uh, first, uh, thanks to Kuyom to invite me. Uh, I have no uh, news about this, but uh, maybe to bring it in, in the right position. So you see a lot of uh, already actual um, used uh, synonyms. That means it's a very old variety, it's a traditional variety, and so you kind of a lot of names. It was already a problem in the 19th century, and so it was decided to uh, focus on one name, and this was Blaufränkisch, uh, that happened at Colmar at the Second Ampelographical Congress. But still now, uh, of course, a lot of synonyms uh, are used. So, why is origin important? Uh, all uh, wineries sell wine with origin, and also for the variety it's important to have an origin. And in the case you produce an autochthonous variety, then it would be helpful for marketing because there is the rumor that um, an autochthonous variety fits perfect to a specific terroir. It could be, could not be, that's uh, not real proved in, in many cases. However, uh, we can also discuss uh, what is autochthonous. Is it only autochthonous for a village, is it autochthonous for a region or for a country or is it for whole mid-Europe? Uh, it, it's an open question. Uh, you can approach in two ways uh, how to declare what is the origin. One is the traditional one, it's the historical one, to look to the books, to the ampelographies and so on and to find uh, hints about the varieties. And the other one is more the new one, is the, uh, the method of genetic analysis. And you look uh, to the genome and find relationship to other varieties and so on. And I will have a, a look to both. Both uh, also carry uh, uncertainties. That means in the case of the, the historical mentioned, uh, you can never be sure if the varieties uh, are good that we have nowadays. 
In the case of Blaufränkisch, you can read in some umbellograph it's, that it's an early ripening variety. So that must be a mistake, eh? that could not be. And then even in the genetic analysis, sometimes you have alleles that differ from that uh, alleles from the parents because during hybridization, there's the possibility that they change their length. Not very frequent, but it, it happens. So no method is perfect. Uh, coming to the genome, that means if you have uh, Graeber has a double set of uh, 19 chromosomes, and this 90 chromosome uh, was divided in the meiosis, and you have uh, a one set of uh, 19 chromosome in the uh, daughter cells, and finally in the pollen or in the ovaries, and then during hybridization, the becoming uh, again a double set. So if you have a co-dominant marker, you can follow the way and you can read within the DNA what has happened with this genotype, how had this uh, genotype appear. Huh? In the case of uh, our genetic fingerprinting, we used uh, simple sequence uh, markers, simple sequence repeats, that's uh, small um, dinucleotides or trinucleotides in, in the core region, uh, whatever. In the core region, you have these repeats, and they are responsible for the polymorphism. And in the flanking uh, regions, you have more stable um, sequences where you have to design the primers and then to develop this locus. And finally, in the lucky case, you got two alleles one allele from the paternal and one allele from the maternal uh, parent. And if it's heterozygous, it, you got more information than it's, it's a homozygous logos. So we choose a lot of uh, uh, loci to define uh, varieties. And with six um, of these markers, we were able worldwide to identify varieties, true varieties, not, not mutants, not, uh, but also mutants are interesting, so we started to add three more, so we have in the meanwhile nine SSR markers to characterize a grapevine. With these markers, you can find in some of the databases of grapevine, international databases or national ones. So, but for the heritage, you need much more. In our case, we decided that you had at least uh, 40, that means for each chromosome, at least two markers. In the case of uh, Blaufränkisch, you can see here the parent Heinisch. More than 20 years we know about it, and uh, it was already supposed. Uh, and yeah, that maybe gives to uh, Blaufränkisch some of the well known traits, maybe the high acidity and so on. But the second um, variety couldn't be found in the normal collections and could not find doing the well known varieties. Eh? But a few years ago in Italy, there was uh, declared a new variety called Spulzina. Spulzina is a, what in heaven is Spulzina? Not known variety at that moment. And it's a very ra ra rare minority variety. And it is characterized uh, as a late ripening variety and was found in Friuli, uh, close to Serbia. A little later in Germany, in one of the collections, they find the similar genotype. Uh, it was given a name, but it was not a true to type variety. That means, in reality, it has no name, but they use the name Blaue Zimmettaube due to visual observation. They, they need an ampelography and declared it as Blaue Zimmettaube. So that was maybe a mistake because at that time already the, the gray Zimmettaube exists and the profiles did not fit together. So maybe it was a mistake or they have not taken into account uh, that the genetic profile would be helpful at that situation. And finally, uh, two years ago in Croatia, there was published about the uh, genetic resources of Croatia and they found the Moda Koso winner. And this is uh, with a synonym of Ranek, or this is the true Blaue Zimetaue. So there is some concurrency between the first is the wrong and the second is the right one because this is identical to the gray Zimetstaube. So we found the real bright Zimetstaube in the meanwhile in Croatia. And what is also interesting is the Spulzina 
is an offspring of uh, the variety Gänsefüßer. Gänsefüßer was at the end of the Middle Ages far spread in Europe. The, you could find it in Germany, in, in Switzerland, in France, in Austria, and ev not everywhere, but in mid-Europe. So, the genetic relationship uh, from the cross Spurzina uh, with Heinisch uh, is exciting because Heinisch is a, a key variety. So the half sister and, and very close related is Wildbacher Blau. You have also a very high acidity and you have similar uh, DNA profiles, and you have also similar anthocyan profiles. So they are the closest varieties together we have in, in Austria. But also uh, similar or, or some relationship is given to Camino A and, and Portuguese Bleu uh, because they are also half sisters or half brothers, whatever you want to have. But there existing also some mutants. I have not very intense. Uh, profiled these mutants, I, I'm sorry, but what I have observed is that there are some more heterozygous types and uh, more, the Blaufränkisch one are more homozygous. So there's still uh, the possibility that Blaufränkisch uh, was selected out as a more homozygous of this uh, gene pool, especially the Schwarzkobe are more heterozygous ones. So, and as Harnisch is one of the, the most important variety for diversity of grapevine in Austria, it's clear that a lot of uh, half-sisters exist, Riesling, Chardonnay, uh, Aricote, and so on, all related to this Blaufinkisch variety. In reality, more than 100 descendants are well known in the meanwhile. So, getting a little more closer to the genome, in the uh, meanwhile, it's well known that uh, the range of the, of the genome, 2,000 centimorgan, and uh, the information was got from a uh, segregating population. If you cross uh, Blaufränkisch with a second, in, in this case Regent, then you have the possibility to see how the, the chromosomes segregate. And finally, you can calculate uh, the, the size of the genome and also uh, calculate the, the base pairs. Uh. However, in the meanwhile, uh, due to the sequence of uh, what is available, we can also define some, some low size, some genes and different chromosomes and so on. But it, it's still an ongoing work. And I, I'm sorry we had not uh, invested a lot in, in Blaufränkisch because we had done times before uh, a lot. And, and uh, at the moment, we are doing it with Lasky Riesling. We are sequencing Lasky Riesling. It's also an interesting variety for mid-Europe. And maybe uh, we can continue with, with Blaufränkisch. Yeah? But what uh, also uh, should be taken into account is that Blaufränkisch gives a lot of chromosomes to varieties also important for Austria, for let's say Zweigel, the Blauburger, uh, Rösler Ratte, and uh, the most uh, recently released Royalne. That's also varieties with some uh, resistance in it. So uh, what was the mistake maybe? The mistake was the assumption that uh, the origin on a, a place can only be where both parents are described. But uh, in reality, we know that a lot of varieties are not described despite they have existed there because only the, the, the most prominent varieties was described in, in uh, ampelographies. So due to the simplification and also the misname, uh, there was a wrong assumption that maybe the, the origin of Blaufränkisch could be from here. So it is probably more legitimate to conclude that the origin is also based on the historical documents where this variety, Blaufränkisch, uh, has appeared. And uh, the historical overview uh, I want to give you, it, I will not be complete, that's clear, but um, I focused on the national uh, views. That means I'm starting with the Slovenian view, and uh, I, I try to cite the ampelographies um, uh, which deal with Blaufränkisch, or even not with Blaufränkisch, but with the parent, uh, the not true uh, Zimmertraube. So the, uh, about the area, uh, I'll say nothing, but Voregger is one of the first who mentioned the, the varieties here in, in Slovenia, 
and he mentioned that 85% are Sipon. We know it also under the name Moslau or Furmint. Eh? And only 0.5% uh, are red wines. And the most red wines, uh, there's not mentioned Blaufränkisch. And even uh, in the Ampelografie vom Rat some years later, also Blaufränkisch is not mentioned. But he mentions uh, Zimet Taube. But the Simetaufe have a lot of synonyms. That means little Welsh, Sipa, and Kauka. And if you conclude to the area where it was grown, it, it seems that it was Kauka. Also a more or less disappeared variety. Cranes, uh, two years later, mentioned Vranek and Kauka, but no Blaufränkisch. So the autochthonous variety uh, for this region was not Blaufränkisch, but Simetaufe, Wrong Zimetrabe Kauka or Vranek. The Trumba is maybe the, uh, the most famous ampelographer, and he had a good relation to Lower Styria. And, uh, and the, in his first ampelography, he did not mention Blaufränkisch, but in the second, he mentioned, but with a lot of mistakes. So he uh, think that maybe uh, Porto, Burgundy, or Frank. Uh, Franconia could be the origin. He mentioned the right names. That means Schwarzfränkische, Frühschwarze, Schwarzkobe. A, let, a lot of synonyms exist at that time. And he mentions one place where it is grown that was first law, is in south of Vienna. So uh, there is an exciting book with, with paintings of the variety available, Kreuzer and Kreuzer. And they have made a, big, uh, a really good job. But Blaufinkisch is not painted there. So we miss this variety. But two Branecks are in this book. And you see already that uh, there was maybe a mistake that two different varieties have the same name. Eh? What is an indication that Blaufinkisch was grown here in the past and maybe uh, propagated and, and uh, disseminated? That's the name Lemberg. Lemberg uh, was a near. Uh, don't know a village or whatever, close to Mar uh, Maripor. And is mentioned in the literature and is mentioned also uh, for the for shipping papers. But uh, it is also supposed that Lemberger could uh, be derived from Schlumberger or changed with Limberg, because Limberg is even an, an synonym in, in Germany for uh, this variety. So next country, Croatia. In Croatia, is a decreasing importance of, of um, Blaufränkisch, and therefore Croatia is from an uh, Austrian ampelographer, Franz Ritter from Heindl, in 1821, uh, and he mentioned uh, very well the autochthonous varieties for Croatia. Even the colleagues in Zagreb use this ampelography today, but uh, not uh, Blaufränkisch. Blaufränkisch is not uh, available uh, in this book. But there is an interesting uh, uh, fact that Sinfand, we heard it today already, maybe some, some uh, hint about the wine quality. And it is supposed that uh, Blaufränkisch gives the name to Zinfandel via his um, synonym Blauer Zirifandel. It was not easy pronounceable, this name, and uh, changed to Zinfandel, and it could be a mixture up because uh, Trina Kastelanski, the true name, was not so well known in former times. Eh? And in the meanwhile, we know that Croatia is uh, the homeland of uh, Moda Kosiva. That means Vrande got the true Zimetstaube. So some impressions of these countries. Coming to Hungary, Hungary is now, uh, let's say, the, uh, from the uh, point of, of, of quantity, the most important uh, producing country. And they never mentioned um, Blaufinkisch as an autochthonous variety. And they do not think that it's uh, derived from the Carpathian uh, gene pool. So they know that it was uh, coming from the eastern parts. And today, you can find it everywhere. That's clear. But the, the hot spots are Chopin, Wieland, and, and, and Egger. But uh, already in the 18th century, there was in the Hungarian Almanach uh, mentioned some varieties. And Gobi Schwarz in this case is not uh, related to Blaufinkisch, could be uh, due to the name, but the description is uh, clearer and, and you can uh, follow that it's a, a, a blue version of Heinisch. 
Wildschwarz is uh, maybe related to the Wildbacher. There exist today also Wildbachers in, in, in Hungary, but uh, Schwarze Zierfandel is maybe the, the, the candidate for this variety. So a different name for, for Blaufränkisch in, in former times. In uh, Rusta Georgikon, uh, Blaufränkisch is not mentioned at the beginning of the 19th century. Shams, uh, maybe one uh, of the special experts of the Hungarian viticulture, uh, said as Blaufränkisch or Kekfrankisch are not used in Hungary at, at, at that time. But for uh, a specific area in, in Austria, he mentioned, uh, south of Vienna, for Slauer Terroir, uh, he mentioned also that it's uh, grown together with uh, Pinot Noir and with uh, Portuguese Blue. So the name at that time was Schwarzfränkisch, and there was uh, some sign on name, uh, Mährisch. Yeah, but Mährisch is maybe already a little confusing because it was never verified what this variety is uh, true to type. The Hungarian ministry recommended for Rus, Chopin, and Bratislava at the end of the 19th century to plant Notch Burgundy, that means Grand Burgundy or, or whatever, uh, but there is an indication that it should come from, from Burgundy, but never have been uh, verified. In the Günther tradition, there's also mentioned Blaufränkisch, and in Scholten Haller's book about the Hungarian wine, uh, it's mentioned that Napoleon Bonaparte uh, likes the Blaufränkisch from Sopron very much, and he traveled a lot, so he had uh, also the possibility to, to compare it with other red wines. However, there is also a might that uh, his soldiers paid this wine with blue francs, and the name should be a result of, of that story, but it's a story. You can imagine that the, the uh, victorious army have not to pay the wine, so they confiscated the wine and not paid it with blue. Um, uh, Frankosh. So, uh, Hungarian had not only troubles with the European community since Orban uh, is in the government, but also before, when they joined the European community, they get forbidden, uh, maybe that was uh, an, a national thing, uh, that they could not write on the label Notch Burgundy. So they started uh, to declare it and uh, inform the customers with the back label and, and write on the back label that that's not Burgundy, but now they sell it under the name Blaufränkisch or Kekfrankosch. But uh, as I already mentioned, the connection to Burgundy uh, was never verified. So some impression from Hungary. Coming to Germany, Franconia was one of the first places where uh, maybe uh, Blaufränkisch arrived. The Earl of Nyberg 300 years ago mentioned it, that he has imported it from Austria. And it was uh, classified as a noble variety and was spread maybe to Württemberg and some areas of Württemberg. And the first documentation in, of Württemberg uh, viticulture in 1826, no Limberger is included in. Later on, uh, 1815, uh, uh, Immanuel Dornfeld also nothing mentioned about uh, Blaufränkisch in his book Anpflanzung der Edler in Traubensorten. So in, 18, in the Weinbauschule, that means at the second half of the 19th century, there was already some indications that uh, Blaufränkisch was grown under the name Limberger, and they discussed if the, the soil and the, the, the climate is appropriated for this variety. Yeah? They use it also together with uh, Portuguese uh, blue. The brothers Bruno uh, from Wiesloch uh, brought it to Stuttgart and recommended it as a uh, uh, very good variety and with dense and storable wines. Uh. Single, uh, one director of Weinsberg uh, uh, recommended it, and he think about uh, uh, early ripening type, so it's not clear if it's real, uh, the Tote, uh, Blaufränkisch or some other variety, maybe he mixed them with Portuguese or whatever. The conclusion is that Blaufränkisch and uh, Blue Portuguese uh, were delivered uh, from Austria, from the Thermenregion, Schlumberger, 
uh, make this job and uh, he earned a lot of money with the, the cuttings to Württemberg, uh, to the ro Royal Court Chamber, but also to private uh, wineries. And there are still some documents uh, available which show that the, the, the trade with uh, cuttings of Blaufränkisch was a very intense uh, uh, business. So in 1866, from, from Lemberg, my company Schlumberger, and 1871, uh, Mr. Fries mentioned that uh, Lemberg uh, are a place very frequent named in, in the monarchy at that time. Huh? And Limberg is a, a village close to Meissen, was also the, the source of uh, material brought to Germany. That's uh, all the, the sources from the German point. We have also some indication that Czech and, and Slovakian had uh, some, some historical documents, but the origin uh, uh, was ever mentioned as Austrian. Unclear till today is the Moravian, the Merische. In my opinion, it could be that it was St. Laurent. And St. Laurent is still very important in the Czech Republic. And uh, there is also a might, Charles IV, the most important emperor in uh, Bohemian and, and the Moravian, that, uh, brought it uh, when he was vicar at Burgundy in the 14th century but it's a story and never verified. Eh? So coming to Italy, there is a little uh, Blaufränkisch known. You can also find in the near of Gorizia some Blaufränkisch and mentioned it the first time in 1877 in Rovasenda. Uh, and for the origin is mentioned Austria. So in France, uh, despite a lot of uh, attempts, to make an, an, an origin of French, it, it never uh, uh, happens. Uh, Great Burgundy is one of these indications also that Charles de Lorraine brought material uh, to Kumpoldskirchen from France, but all these facts uh, could never be uh, verified. We island Moral, very uh, important ampelographers from France, uh, mentioned uh, this variety for Elsass, but no other place. And Elsass, uh, we know that the brothers Baumann got this material from, from Austria. Eh? Gallet, uh, one of the modern ampelographers, thought that Lemberg uh, is the Tote is Luf, that means uh, could be a variety from the Ukraine, but all uh, these facts could never uh, be confirmed. So uh, maybe that was the idea to increase the prestige for this variety to, to give a uh, French origin, we don't know. But uh, in the history, a, a lot of, of these attempts uh, you can observe. Huh? Uh, Gamay is a half-sister, we already have mentioned, but uh, is also a synonym in Romania and Bulgaria for uh, Blaufränkisch. And Portuguese Leroux is a, a synonym for Blaufränkisch in, in Elsa's region to Austria. The oldest citation in ampelography is Mr. Helbling, around uh, 77. Uh, and he mentioned that this variety is uh, cultivated around Vienna, in the south of Vienna, and the best wines are coming from uh, Mödling and Pfaffstetten. And uh, yeah, but he made a little confusion with the uh, synonyms. Black Morio is also an indication for a French origin and not for an Austrian origin. So uh, the general uh, agreement in, in, in Austria was long that uh, is a very old variety, it's already from the time of Charles the Great or Charlemagne, and uh, at his time the varieties were divided in two groups. The one was the Hunische and the other was the Frankische. Eh? But in reality, a Blaufränkisch is a mix of both. Eh? So it could not be true. And even if you look at uh, some of the, the, the individual genotypes, uh, I estimated it would uh, be put to the Hunnish and not to the, to the Frankish. So however, uh, this is also more a story than a reality. But we have also uh, other old sources, especially from Mr. Baumann, who recommended Schwarze Gemeine and Schwarze Fränkische to improve the wine quality for Lower Austria. So it's maybe the oldest citation 
complete. Chaptal, a French e expert, mentioned Limberg as one of the best places for red wine, and they use this red wine also on the, on the uh, card in Vienna. Bustet mentioned um, Blaufränkisch for Baden, but also in combination with Pinot and, and uh, Portuguese. Uh, Burger uh, is, in, in principle, a, a very exact uh, observer, and he has made a, a very nice ampelography, but in the case of Blaufränkisch, he failed completely. That means uh, he gave the variety the name Catonia Burgundica, that means also this uh, Burgundian origin. And uh, what was more worse, he put five completely different varieties in this name. That means uh, Schwarzkobe is acceptable, that would be the right one, but Frühschwarze, that's wrong, and also Schwarze Muscatella is wrong, and Merisch is an additional wrong. That means he had made a, a big failure. So Limberg, I already mentioned, uh, was known for excellent wine. Also, my name colleague, uh, the emperor, liked uh, Blaufränkisch from Limberg. Babo uh, complained at a wine uh, grape show that they, they brought Blaufränkisch and called it uh, Natsch Burgundi uh, or Burgundi. And he was one of the first uh, showing that there are a lot of mistakes in these uh, ampelographies. Even Schmiedl and, and Reckendorf uh, described the variety for their region and confirmed that it's a, a high quality variety. The best description in the 19th century is from uh, Hermann Goethe. He was uh, a lot of time uh, busy in, in, in Maripur and he knows uh, a lot about the varieties and his description, with his description you can identify the varieties because it was very careful and, and uh, a lot of details are mentioned. So it's, it's easy with, to work with this uh, ampelography and he mentioned this uh, Blaufränkisch coming from Lower Austria near Fislau. Uh, he mentioned the, the origin and the family Schlumberger should be involved in the spreading. And uh, he mentioned also that only uh, single wine um, production is found in, in Siebenhirten, Marzen, Füßlau, and in other places they combine it with uh, different varieties. And from Füßlau they were brought to Hungary and, and Croatia. Coming to the 20th century, uh, Mr. Mittmann reported uh, that it's the most important variety for Klosterneuburg. Nowadays, it's completely changed. You can find only uh, very small plantings in Kloster Neuburg. 1932, Matthias Arnold mentioned uh, still existing synonyms at that time, Spätschwarzer, Schwarzkober, Großburg und Amerisch, Limberger, and so on. And this was a big confusion the whole time. Uh, too many synonyms are a problem. And finally, the, the last uh, citations, Mr. Brickler mentioned uh, that after the Philoxor catastrophe, uh, Blaufränkisch moved uh, very intense to, to Burgenland. Ruckenbauer Traxler mentioned this as a lower Austrian variety, and Hornigel thought that the quality of Blaufränkisch in Sopron have a little uh, decreased due to the mixing it with, uh, Blau, uh, with blue Portuguese, and that uh, at the other side in Austria, they make it as a single wine vi uh, vinification and, and they keep the better quality. So some impressions from our country, coming to a conclusion about a Blaufränkisch is a cross of Spulzina Hainisch. Where exactly the, the cross, uh, the pre first breeding step take place, we do not know. No, no one has documented it and we have no uh, a real paper about it. But the historical oldest citations are from the uh, south of Vienna, and the literature for the Austrian origin is, in my opinion, convincing. Eh? So Spulzina could also be available in Austria at that time, but hidden under one of the synonyms or uh, without any, any specific name. Eh? As Gensfüßer was already here in Austria times before, and it is mentioned it could be uh, very easily. And the propagation and the dissemination of the variety is close linked uh, to the family of Schlumberger and even the villages Lemberg and Limberg. 
despite we do not know exactly what Limberg is, is, is uh, known. Uh, I had also some, some uh, documents about clones because it was an, a topic, but as I see there's my presentation already too long, I will only show you one, one slide. Uh, that's the idea, you have three different markers and the green and the yellow are stable, eh? and the blue one is an, an, an polymorphic marker, and then you can find the uh, uh, variability within the variety. Eh? And these are the clones at the moment available. So for Slovenia, I uh, contact a colleague uh, in, in uh, Ljubljana. In the next years, there will be four or five clones uh, ready. But in Austria, we have at the moment 22 certified clones from Blau Frankish. In uh, Germany, four, in Hungary, six, in Czech Republic, seven, and Slovakia, nine. So from the point of view, uh, the, the material is available, so you can uh, plant it. That's uh, sure uh, high quality material, and there is no uh, problem, no obstacle for enlarge the production. Thank you for your interest, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Regner. So regarding the origin of the grape variety, yes, it, it's true that this is, like I would say, the marketing point for, for, each, for each winery to, to, to tell this, this is our grape variety. Uh, I usually tell people about regional grapes, not Austrian or Slovenian, because they say, well, Frankish, like it's really connected to Pannonian flat, kind of. So, and it's nowhere except in New Jersey. Nowhere else, and I think this, this, uh, this is a good point. But, but if you consider uh, Pinot Noir, you have it in whole Europe. Yes. And no, nobody uh, is frightened about it, that it's not an autochthonous variety to sell it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's a big one, yeah. yeah Pinot yeah. Noir. Yeah, and, and uh, there was a presentation, like in Europe, every, uh, yeah, you said it, we all use the same name. No, some people even call it Gevray Chambertin, so uh, it's not the same name all, the, all around the place. Yeah. Is there a question, please? And then we go to for the, yeah, and then we have, uh, uh, can you explain why you, you mentioned the number of clones available for Germany, Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, where Austria fits into that picture? So, sorry? The number of the clones you, clones you mentioned in the previous, clones? how many are available? Were studied for Austria. How many from Austria are 22, available? 22, 22 from Austria. Oh, that was the 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Is there another one? Good. Thanks a lot okay, thank you. for the presentation. And uh, we are back uh, 1.15. No. Uh, we'll be back like.